we got a little song we say to welcome our guests. Come on, y'all sing it. Glad you came. meaningful and life-changing to help you move through the challenges of life? Then join Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church of Gastonia for an inspirational message prepared just for you. If you're looking for dynamic worship, inspirational teaching, and a friendly atmosphere, you can visit us on Sundays at 221 West Bradley Street in Gastonia, North Carolina. For more information about our ministry, you can call 704-865-9016. To order your personal copy of today's message or any other broadcast, please call 704-865-9016 and indicate the broadcast date. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast with Bishop John A. McCullough II and the Friendship Christian Church. Make sure you join us next week at the same time. And remember, let God take control and let the Spirit flow. Amen. All right. Go to Hebrews and go to chapter number five and go down to verse number 12. Hebrews chapter number five, verse 12. I'm going to read verse 11 as well. It says, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing for though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and you have come to need milk and not solid food for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Chapter 6 even says, therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Is that the essence of what your Bible says? Last week we started a message entitled Overdue, Overdue, Overdue. And uh, that's what I want to go back to today, and we'll do Overdue Part 2. Look at your neighbor before you take your seat and grab your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, oh, good neighbor, good, good neighbor. I don't know about you, but I'm going to help Bishop talk about overdue part two. Turn on the other side of behind you. They weren't paying attention. Shake them. Say, neighbor, oh, good neighbor, good, good neighbor. I don't know about you. But I'm going to help Bishop talk about overdue part two. Will you help me help him? Now drop those hands and give God a praise right there. Very quickly, very quickly, let me just kind of give you the uh, essence of what we talked about last week so we can jump into this week's message. We talked about overdue, um, the meaning not having arrived or it has not happened or it has not been done by an expected time. There are things that uh, we expect uh, that will happen at a certain point and when they don't happen and we say it's overdue long overdue We talked about library books when you keep them past the date you get a fine because most of the times uh, When something is overdue there will be negative consequences now uh, we talked about how uh, We have to mature uh, in the things concerning God 
Now, uh, the Hebrew uh, writer here uh, was dealing with the people, and the people uh, were beginning to get dull as he started to talk about uh, some deep things. And he talked about how Jesus Christ was uh, the high priest now on the order of Melchizedek. And he started explaining the doctrine, and, and the people began to become dull. And, and right in the middle of his discourse, he, he stops and he says, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For he said, by this time, you ought to be now at a place that you are teachers. You've been saved a long time. You've been in the church a long time. You've been a part of ministry a long time. And, and so he begins to rebuke them uh, as a result of how they had become dull and distracted. And they were no longer interested uh, in hearing the deeper things of God. And so there was the expectation that uh, because of the time that they had been apart, they should be further along than they were. And the same thing happens today that many times people have been a part of the faith and they got saved, but they have not grown. They have not matured uh, because they, like these people uh, that the writer spoke about, uh, have become dull in their hearing. We are quick to hear many things and get many a lot of information but when it comes to the things of God sometimes we just don't have time and they become boring to us I suggested to you last week that according to Ezekiel chapter number two that uh, that he begins to talk about how uh, the people had begun to rebel against the word of God they no longer were obedient and they had become uh, rebellious and, and God sent Ezekiel to go talk and he says you're going to Israel and uh, they, will, uh, may, they may refuse to hear the word because this is a rebellious house. He said, but yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. Whether we hear or do what God says or not does not mean that the prophet has not done his job, that the preacher, the teacher, the exhorter has not done his or her job. And so we become overdue when we come and we hear a word and then we rebel against the word, uh, he, then we are in need of a rebuke. And that's what the people were getting there uh, in Hebrews. They were getting a rebuke because they had become rebellious and stubborn and they did not uh, hear the word of God. And, and uh, they began to transgress against God's word. I suggested to you last Sunday uh, that we can see uh, the dullness and the need that, that they are overdue when we look at how, first of all, we are weak in our prayer life. We don't pray like we ought to. We suggested that there was a lack of enthusiasm for worship of our God. Come on, we come in sometimes, we're so lethargic, uh, unenthused, and, and yet we get excited about a whole lot of other things. Uh, God wants us to get excited about him. How many of you know that this morning? And then three, we talked about how uh, many people are still walking in fear and unbelief. Still doubting God's word, not believing, afraid of this, instead of standing strong in faith. We suggested also for that many times people are overdue. They should have matured, but they are caught off in arguments over things that don't win souls to the kingdom. My God, churches spend a whole lot of time uh, arguing over things that don't win anybody to Jesus Christ. Do I have anybody? We talked about how people uh, also have become comfortable in their carnality, in their flesh. They, they do things that don't line up with God's word or his spirit, and they have become comfortable in carnality. We also suggested last week that people are unwilling to forgive. Many people will not forgive and, and uh, they, they continue to hold things. But we, and when we mature, we learn how to forgive because Christ first forgave us. Isn't that right? And, and then last week, because it was communion, we suggested that um, the people were eating and drinking at the Lord's table unworthily. 
Now this morning, I want to, I said I, I would pick out a couple of these uh, issues uh, and share on them, but I'm going to share one. And, and the three that struck me the most were um, that we are negligent in our prayer life. And then we are comfortable in carnality. And then we refuse or, uh, or to be rebuked or disciplined. And that's the one I want to look at right now, that, that we refuse rebuke and discipline. Now, let's go over in that same book to chapter number 12. Chapter number 12 here of Hebrews, chapter number 12. And um, here again, understand what's happening. And in verse number one, it says, therefore, uh, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Elder Chad, will you give me the other mic? This one is cutting out of something right there. Thank you. Somebody say hallelujah. Bless his name. Glory to God. All right. So he says here that um, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, understand the backdrop here. The background is that um, these people were experiencing suffering. They were experiencing hardship. This was the new faith, new Christianity, and, and uh, they, they were among hostile people, and some people were being persecuted. Some people were losing their lives, and so the writer is writing to them, trying to encourage them not to give up. Tell your neighbor, don't give up. You can't give in. You can't give up. He was encouraging them not to give in. Don't throw in the towel. No matter what happens in your life, you got to continue to persevere. So that's what this whole book was about, the book of Hebrews, because they were about to backslide. They, uh, they were about to go back to their old way of living. And so the writer here, uh, as he has done throughout the book, uh, tries to use another analogy so that they will understand that they got to persevere and continue in the faith despite what might be happening to them. So he says, he says, he sets uh, uh, the setting here in the context uh, in sort of an auditorium or a stadium like. He says that we also have and we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So they understood sporting events, and this was like a race. And so uh, he's saying that uh, we've got all around us people who are encouraging us, all right? We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So he says that because of that, he's thinking about the runner who comes in, and you know you come in with your warm-up zone and everything, uh, but when you get ready to race, you notice that the runners begin to strip off uh, their outer garments, their jackets and their sweatpants and so forth, because those things will uh, hinder them from running the race. So he says that we've got a great cloud of witnesses, and what he was speaking about were those who had gone on before them, those who were seated in heaven, that they were the witnesses that were watching the next generation as they were coming through life in faith in Jesus Christ. So he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us uh, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You know, uh, when you think about running the race, you got to get rid of sin. You got to get rid of weight. You got to get rid of anything that will block you and, and keep you from running effectively. And so that's what he's encouraging them to do, that they got to loose those things from them. And he says so that we can run with endurance this race that is set before us. He says, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the beginning. He initiated our faith, and he completed our faith. He says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of, growth, of God. Now notice now, he is saying that you are running your race as a Christian, as a believer. You got to strip away everything uh, that would prohibit you. And, and then he says, let me use for an example, look at Jesus as you run your race. As you think about quitting, because some, uh, even here this morning, you have contemplated quitting the faith. You've contemplated going back. And some have gone back and come back and gone back. He said, but you got to continue. He said, let's look at Jesus for example. He says, he is the one uh, who has been through something. And yet the joy, he did it with joy that was set before him. He went through the cross. He, he was crucified. Crucifixion was the most shameful death one could experience. He says that he went through, he endured the cross. He went through it. He says despising the shame, even though it was shameful, as Jesus hung there. You know, you see the nice pictures of Jesus hanging there on the cross, and uh, he, he, uh, he's got on a, a, a loin garment and so forth. They hung him naked up there. They wanted them to be ashamed. And people would come by and say, look at Jesus. He, he saved others. He healed others. And now he can't even do anything about his own situation. They wagged their tongues at him. And yet Jesus hung there because he understood I have a purpose. I've got to die in order to satisfy our father for the sin that men had committed. And after all of that, after his death, after his resurrection, uh, he was now, he passed through the heavens. He is seated at the right hand of God and in fact making intercession for you and me. He says in verse 3, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Sometimes, you know, we can't take anything. We don't like somebody to look at us funny. Huh? We, you know, if, if somebody looks at us funny, we're ready to throw in the towel. We're ready to quit. But he says, look at him. He endured hostility. All of this from sinners against him. He said, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. He said, so when you get to the point that you feel like giving up, when you get to the point that you feel like throwing in the towel, when you get discouraged uh, by being a Christian and it seems like maybe things aren't working well, it uh, seems like you go forward and you got to go backwards and all the challenges that you face. He said, look at Jesus and what he experienced. Consider him that he endured this hostility. All right? He says, I don't want you to become weary and discouraged in your soul. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, don't get discouraged. Be not weary in well-doing. Bible says, for in due season, you will reap if you faint not. Tell your neighbor, this is not fainting season, right? This is not the time to faint. This is not the time to throw in the towel. You may have had some stuff to happen in your life, but this is never, there is never a time to quit. And then verse 4, he says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed. We complain, things aren't working out. We have pity parties and we cry and, you know, we experience challenges and even tragedies. And he said, yet compared to Jesus, understand, you have not even resisted bloodshed. He shed his blood. He sacrificed his life. He shed his blood, uh, striving against sin. And he then says in verse 5, And have, and you have forgotten the exhortation which, which speaks to you as sons. All right? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now, I'm talking about that um, believers nowadays refuse to uh, accept rebuke and chastisement and discipline. We don't like uh, to be chastised. We don't like to be disciplined. Now, he says don't make light of discipline. Because discipline has a purpose. Isn't that right? He says, I don't want you to lose your heart. 
I, I don't want you to lose your enthusiasm and your encouragement. Now, uh, you got to recognize that, uh, that God will rebuke us. God will chasten us, chastise us. God will uh, discipline all of us. Now, what is God doing whenever he disciplines us, when he rebukes us? We got to recognize that the Bible says God loves those he chastens. He loves those he chastises. He loves those he disciplines. Uh, you got to understand that there are some times and things that we do uh, as the people of God uh, in the church, as we are connected to Christ, uh, that we don't like to receive rebuke or, or discipline uh, from the word of God. And uh, you got to understand that sometimes what happens is that people will walk away from the faith and God when they are rebuked, when they go through discipline, when they go through challenges. And sometimes people will get upset and walk away from God, walk away from the faith because there are many people who are disillusioned to believe that every day as a Christian is supposed to be a perfect sunny day. We're not supposed to have challenges and issues and so forth. But let me tell you something, uh, that if you have been hearing teaching that does not tell you that there's some storms going to be in your life and you're going to have some situations that occur in your life, you've been listening to the wrong gospel. you, you got to get rid of this feel-good gospel because Jesus said in this life you're going to have some trials and some tribulations. But he said be of good cheer because I have overcome them. Tell your neighbor you're going to go through some things as a believer as a matter of fact because you are a believer all hell opposes you the devil is fighting against you on every hand and sometimes God allows us to go through disciplines and chastenings and and rebukes and then sometimes I've seen this more and more today that uh, not only will people walk away from the faith but they get offended and leave the church and if they don't leave the church, they will stop serving in the church. They will stop giving in the church. Try, uh, they, uh, they, they will try to do other things. And, and they don't want anybody to discipline them. you got to speak nicely to them. You can't ever give a strong word of rebuke uh, in this day. And then if they don't leave, they try to draw other people uh, into their place of immaturity. And if you allow somebody to draw you into somebody else's place of immaturity, then you're immature. Huh? Isn't that right? Because remember now, the issue we were dealing with has to do with the fact that he, the, the writer says, by now, you ought to be teachers. You're overdue. You've been at this long enough. You've been at this thing long enough. You should have matured past some of the things that we're still doing. And you ought to be able to take a strong word of rebuke. You ought to be able to take God's disciplining and uh, chastisement. But we will allow somebody else, whenever you give a word of rebuke or rebuke somebody, and they will, because of their immaturity, uh, they'll get mad, fold up their arms, and refuse to release their gift and all that. But let me tell you something. You can refuse to release your gift, but I've learned that God will work right around your gift. Can I get some help here? God will work right around your gift and what it is you're supposed to be contributing. Uh, don't you ever think that if you don't do it, God's not going to get it done. That's from the bishop to everybody on the parking lot. You step away, you walk away and say, I'm not doing this. I'm upset. I don't like what they said. I don't like what's happening in my life. God will say, fine, because I'm not going to force you to do it. You ought to be mature enough now to be able to stand and say, God, I receive the rebuke. I receive the chastisement. Whatever I'm going through right now, it is well with my soul because I understand that if Jesus went through what Jesus went through, what I'm going through is nothing. And then, and then not only people will walk away from God, walk away from the faith, or they'll get offended and leave the church. And, and then, oh, my God, we got more people on Facebook talking about I've been church hurt. I've been church hurt. I've been, see, that's why I don't serve. That's why I don't go anymore. That's why I'm just through with church. I'm just through because I got church hurt. Now, somebody didn't let you have your way in church. 
or somebody rebuked you or told you that was wrong or preached some, some, uh, some aspect of sin, you got upset because that's what you're doing. And now I got a church hurt. Oh, I'm just so hurt. You want to know a real church hurt? Get a picture of Jesus hanging on the cross with spikes in his hand and spikes in his feet and being pierced in the side. That's a real church hurt because it was the church people. It was the temple. It, it, it was the religious people that did that to Jesus. If Jesus could go through that, my God, just because somebody didn't speak to you, maybe somebody didn't acknowledge you, you didn't get your name called and all that, and I'm just church hurt. Uh, somebody I, you know, and all that, they didn't do me right. Come on, it's time to grow up. You ought to, it, it's long overdue, and we got too many people using the excuse, I don't go to church because I'm church hurt. You go to work. I know they rebuke you. And they tell you when you can come, when you can go. No, you can't be off. No, you come into work now. You, no, you stay overtime. You get in, get your hips in here. Huh? You go right on, tail tucked in, but your church hurt. Because somebody said uh, that, that, that you're out of order, you're supposed to be doing this or that. There's an expectation of you, but now I'm church hurt. No, the devil got you. I can't get anybody. Now, I'm, I'm also speaking to the audience on, on live streaming. Some of y'all sitting right now watching TV's church because you say your church hurt. It's time you ought to be over it. Somebody say we ought to be over it by now. Walking around sour. Wonder what's wrong. What's going on? What what happened? Oh, you just don't know how they did me. I'll never be in another group again. I said I who you serving? Who you serving? Who you serving? Are you serving God or are you serving man? Because if you're serving man, uh, then you have made man your idol. But if you say God is my priority, I don't care what you say about me. I'm going to give my gift to God. I'm going to surrender my life to God. Oh, come on, somebody. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to do what God says do. Come on, somebody. Because in the end, i got to stand before the judge, and i got to give an account of what I've done in my body, good or bad. And the judge, look at your neighbor and say, uh-oh, it ain't you. It ain't you. You're not the judge. You're not the judge. It's our father. So, so we got to recognize. He says, he says that uh, we don't like, we don't like chastening. And then verse number seven. It says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Huh? Do you hear that? But if we are without chastisement, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Be glad he chastises us. Be glad that he gives us a stiff word of rebuke. Be glad that he uh, calls us on the carpet. Be glad he convicts us. Be glad that he allows us to go through various trials and various tests in our life. You ought to be glad because he does it because he loves you and that he calls you sons. Now, now, now sons, that's, that's just uh, uh, common. We, we're talking about male and female. All right? So, so he says that because he sees you as a son, uh, then he is trying to discipline you and uh, he allows us to go through all kinds of uh, discipline. Sometimes uh, it's a, a, a job circumstance. Maybe uh, it's an illness that we are hit with. Maybe it's a financial crisis. Maybe uh, some things that uh, are small. There are some things that are large and, and sometimes he allows people to get in office uh, and, and governmental leadership uh, trying to discipline us and so forth um, the things that are not pleasant think of in the last little while things that have happened to you that may not have been pleasant that didn't bring you uh, automatic joy 
that brought some frustration, some aggravation, and, and, and maybe some things collapsed on you. Maybe some things broke down on you. Well, let me tell you something, and that if you're maturing in God, you got to know that God allows. Now, I'm not saying that God caused that to happen, but God allows some things to happen uh, in our life. God is not punishing us, uh, but he uses these things to discipline us. Because Jesus already received the punishment uh, for sin and we are now under grace and, and uh, we are being matured and, and the things that have happened. My God, I can't appreciate the sun if I've never experienced the rain. Isn't that right? I can't experience and, and appreciate healing if I've never been ill. So the thing is that uh, some of these things that he allows us to go through, he allows us to go through them because we are sons. And listen, if you are uh, not one who will receive and be a partaker of God's discipline, verse 8 says, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Are y'all listening? See, now understand that uh, in ancient Israel, Discipline included education. And the father taught the children the law of God, the word of God. It, it includes coaching and, and encouraging. So uh, that's a part of discipline. And that's why whenever you come to the uh, worship and you come to Bible study, when you study uh, that, that he's instructing us, he has given us teachers and leaders and pastors and so forth after his own heart because he loves us and he's disciplining us uh, so that we can grow up and we can mature and that we can be who God wants us to be in the earth. If we receive human discipline, then we should receive fatherly discipline from God and from his leaders. Look at verse number 9. We're still at chapter 12 of Hebrews. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Come on, we receive discipline from our earthly fathers. Isn't that right? We got whippings, we got beatings, and uh, uh, we were disciplined. And uh, we were disciplined because we were sons. We were children of those uh, who were raising us, and we respected that. We honored that. We received it. We didn't like it. He said, so if you receive rebuke, chastisement, and discipline from your earthly father, then uh, you ought to be uh, more readily ready to be subject to the father, our heavenly father. He says, for in verse 10, for they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. See, recognize that there's a reason that he is disciplining us because he's trying to take us somewhere. He's trying to mature us. He's trying to show us how to live in power in this world where the world opposes you because you are a believer. Uh, but listen, if you can't stand being talked about sometimes and criticized and misunderstood sometimes, then you can't really be effective as an ambassador and a disciple for Jesus Christ. Is that right? And so understand then that, um, that he says that uh, we are in a time now and we are leading crowds of people now where you can't say anything that might hurt their feelings. Not if you want to cry out. Huh? I, I, I'm not against crowds and folk, but you can't speak against sin if you want to cry out. Huh? You can't rebuke folk and say, listen, you're living wrongly. That doesn't line up with the word of God. The Bible said, yeah, no, we got we to gotta preach it all the way from Genesis to maps. Huh? Everything in there. We got to release it. And we're in a day now where people do not want to hear strong, sound doctrine. And the Bible says that in the last times, 
people will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power. They will come and sit, and they will go through the motion. They will go through. They'll worship. They'll praise. They'll participate. But when you begin to go down their road about their lifestyle and the way they're living, they will get offended. They don't want to receive discipline. They don't want to receive rebuke. And they will try to find some place somewhere where they can sit comfortable. But the Holy Ghost told me a couple of weeks ago, he says, listen, I want you to tell everybody in the church that their membership card is no longer valid. You can't just be a member anymore. You got to be a disciple. You got to become an ambassador for Christ. And God is going to make us uncomfortable while we are seated in heavenly places. I wish I had somebody in here. Uh, if you don't want to hear what thus says the Lord, then my God, you might have to find a place that makes you comfortable in your foolishness. Because he won't let me stay comfortable in mine. And I'm not going to let you stay comfortable in yours. I get the rebuke first. Y'all not helping. Huh? Yeah. And so that's the day we're in now. Netta. We want a soft gospel. Yeah, we want cheap grace. We want, we want to just all get in without conviction, without repentance. And you got people who are now uh, teaching a doctrine uh, of, of, of all inclusion. That you don't have to live right. You don't have to repent. Everybody's going to heaven. That's a lie uh, straight from the devil. It's deception. You got to recognize that you are going to be accountable for your life. And I'm responsible if I keep standing and just giving you poems that don't bring conviction. And make you check yourself before you wreck yourself. And he's going to hold me accountable. And I don't want to be accountable for not telling you the truth. And so if you're not comfortable, good. You and tell your neighbor you're in the right place. You're in the right place. You can sit, but you're in the right place. And, and so, and so we got to move beyond this day that we're in. Nobody wants uh, you. Don't tell me truth. Don't give me a hard word. I don't. I don't want to deal with it. I'm not going. To, and then we start asking everybody's opinion. What you think about it? What you do? You think it's all right? You know. You, you know how people do. You get a word and you think, um, what do you think? I heard what the preacher said. I didn't know the Bible said, but all of us, you know, start putting the, all of us do something. You know, you are saints now. You're not sinners saved by grace. You are saints in him, in light. If you just see yourself, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace, guess what you're going to do? You're going to keep on sinning. Huh? Because I'm just a sinner saved by grace. You know, uh, you, you, you speak those things uh, that be not as though they were. And when you speak, I'm just a sinner, then that's what you're going to do. But if you say I'm a saint in God, you're going to fight with everything you got, every word you got with the Holy Ghost in you, not to fall and succumb to the stuff that drags us down to the pits of hell. I wish I had somebody in here. You're not going to like it, but it's going to help you. Now, verse number 11 says, now chastening seems, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Somebody ought to praise God right there. My God, it, children misunderstand discipline. Huh? How many of you understood discipline? Your mama or your daddy whipping your hiney and they telling me I'm doing this because I love you. That's the most ridiculous thing. If you love me, get this bell off my back. If you love me, give me the keys to the car and let me go. Huh? They don't understand discipline and neither do immature believers understand discipline. Whenever we uh, misunderstand discipline, we don't understand the outcome of discipline. You got to recognize that, that an early discipline will have future impact. Early discipline will have future impact. Come on. That's right. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart. You know, I saw a poster one time that said, bring them up in uh, Sunday school and they won't be brought up in court. 
John chapter number 15. Uh, somebody say an early discipline will have future impact. John chapter number 15. Let me hurry. It says in verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Do you understand that? He prunes. What is pruning? Pruning is a type of discipline. When the branches start getting a little wild, they need trimming. Isn't that right? They need pruning. And, and the pruning is not to destroy them. But when you go in, in the strange, you can go in and you can cut dead things off of the branches and dead leaves and uh, twigs and things. When you begin to cut them off, what begins to happen? You begin to see new growth start spurting out. My God, didn't we just cut these edges and look at them now? Two weeks later, three weeks later, a month later, it looks like it's producing and growing again. You see, because the discipline was never meant to kill you, but the discipline was meant for you to have future growth, future maturity, future success. I can't get anybody in here. You got to recognize, he says, that those branches uh, that are bearing nothing, he takes them away. But those who are bearing fruit, those who are growing, those who are maturing, he prunes them that they may bear more fruit. I wish I had somebody that would understand that sometimes what you're going through, the challenges that you meet, sometimes the word of discipline that comes to you, the word of rebuke that comes to you, is not to bring destruction to you, but it's to bring maturity. It's to give you a power going forward. See, because the hell that I've been through uh, allows me to know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My God, come on, somebody. Hell's hounds been on your trail. The enemy has been fighting in your family, in your marriage, in your children, in your finances, against your body. But when you fight through and you pray through and you put the word of God on it, you become stronger. You become more powerful. You become to say, I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. You begin to say that uh, I am of God, a uh, little children, for greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world because I am an overcome. Look at your neighbor's neighbor. The discipline, the pruning is doing that. It's putting you at another dimension. Some of you are going to get more power. You're going to walk in more victory. You're going to walk in more authority because you have been through some tears. Come on, somebody. I've had some tears in my eyes. I've had some pain in my life. But it came. It doesn't make sense to the immature. But it came to make me stronger. I'm stronger. I'm wiser. Come on. Because of all that I've been through. And if you knew what I've been through, come on, look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, if you knew the hell I've been through. You would praise God like I do. Can I get some help in here? So, so, so the discipline, early discipline, will have future impact. And, and then, and then the, the last thing I want to tell you, unless you get dull, is uh, go back to Hebrews chapter 11, chapter 12. I want you to go down to verse... Tell your neighbor, you're overdue. Verse number 11 in the B part. Um, the first part says, now no chastening seems to be joyful. You getting your hind part told off and, and you, God telling you, you know you're doing something wrong and you're not living like you ought to and you ought to cut that out. And because of what the word said, he says that um, it's going to afterward, it's going to yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Huh? And, and so he says, he says that you understand that we may share in holiness. It calls us to walk uprightly. It causes us to change our ways. It causes us to seek God more when we are being chastened and rebuked, when we're being reminded of our life and our lifestyles and the things that don't line up with God. Uh, we ought to receive those things with joy because they are helping us to live righteously. Do I have anybody that's listening in here? Go over to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Ask the Lord to give me something that'll help him shout. Go 
2 Timothy chapter number 3 and go down to verse number 15. It says, and that from childhood, this is 2 Timothy, and this is chapter 3, verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, verse 16, is given by inspiration of God, all Scripture, and is profitable, is going to do you good. For doctrine, it's going to give you the instruction for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's what the word of God does. All right? What's the purpose? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everything you need to do in life, if you get the word and let the word instruct you, let the word discipline you, let the word chasten you, let the word correct you in everything you pursue to do, God's going to show up right in it. In your marketplace ministry, in your career, in your family, in your marriage, everything concerning you. When you see the word of God as being the inspiration from God, don't let anybody challenge you and tell you that this is not truth. I got to another truth and all that stuff. I get people trying to give me inbox messages and sending me all kinds of things, trying to challenge my Christianity. And my thing is, you believe what you want to believe, but the word that I have received, I'm going to stand on that word until I die. Call me crazy. Call it a white man's gospel. Whatever you want to do, call me a slave if you want to. But this is the word of God that I received, and I'm going to stand on this word, and I'm going to hold fast to this word because it's the word word that has brought me where it's brought me now and it's the word that's going to take me for I wish I could get somebody in here today I'm done I'm done he said that's what the word is doing and then and then finally in that last clause there of uh, Hebrews chapter number 12 he says down there somewhere around verse number 12 you remember now, he's trying to encourage you. Come on, everybody receives, experiences discouragement. Am I right? Somebody might be sitting in here right now full of discouragement, feeling hopeless, feeling doomed. You drug yourself in here. You've been going through lately. You've lost jobs. You've lost relationships. You've lost finances. You have experienced health issues, and, and you've been going through, but He's saying, don't give up. Come on, minister that up and down your road. Don't give, don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Why should I be discouraged? Why should the shadow come when Jesus is my portion? Uh, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. Look at what he says in verse number 12, 12, 12. He said, therefore, what, everything I've said up until this point, I've said it so you can understand. He said, therefore, I know you feel like throwing in the towel. I know they've been taking Christians' lives. I know they've been persecuting people. He said, but therefore, everything I've said to you, he says, I want you to strengthen your hands which are hanging down. And he said, and the feeble knees that you're having. He said, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. And he said, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. And so he was telling us, you got to recognize that no matter what you're going through in life, no matter how you've been challenged in life, no matter what you've been experiencing in your walk with God, that God doesn't want you to give up. He didn't promise that every day was going to be sunny. He didn't say that I'm going to always have a pocket full of money and that my bank account's going to always overflow. He said, but if I be faithful uh, with the things that I have come and the things that I, he's given me, he said, if you be faithful over a few things, he said, I'll make you ruler over many. I know your head might be hung, it, hung down now, but lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. 
I know you've been going through sickness lately. I know you've experienced some premature deaths in your family. I know you've had some setbacks and, and some stumbling blocks thrown in your way. He said, but don't you be discouraged. Uh, don't you be dismayed. Don't you allow anything to turn you back. Uh, because you got to keep pressing forward. Because you got to do as Paul says. Paul says that uh, it's not that I have apprehended everything. He said, but this one thing I do. He said, I forget those things which are behind me. And I press forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Jesus Christ. Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you're overdue. Um, stop running when you're running the problems. Uh, stop backsliding whenever you get a hard way. Uh, but keep your hand uh, in his hand. Keep your hand in the master's hand. Put your trust uh, in the Lord. Uh, and lean not to your own understanding. Uh, but in all your ways, uh, acknowledge him. Uh, and he will. Won't he do it? Uh, I said he will. Fight your battle. Uh, he'll give you a way out of no way. Uh, he'll cause a river in the desert. Uh, he'll cause crooked places to be made straight. Uh, he'll bring high places down. Uh, he'll cause those curvy places. Uh, yes, to stand up rightly. I don't know about you, uh, but I want the world to know uh, that I'm going to serve the Lord. Uh, my heart is fixed. Uh, my mind is made up. Uh, call me crazy call me a fanatic you could be further along if you didn't love jesus you could be doing this or that if you don't love jesus but i don't know about you some folk have houses and land some folk choose silver and gold these things they treasure and forget about their soul but i decided a long time ago that I'm going to make Jesus uh, my choice. Uh, the road might get rough. Uh, the going might get tough. Uh, and sometimes i got to speak to some mountains and tell the mountains to get behind me. But if you got faith uh, the size of a mustard seed, uh, you can prevail. Look at your name and say, neighbor, you are a winner. <laughs> and failure for you is not an option. Uh, say yes. Uh, he might have to give us a little handy whipping. He might have to discipline us along the way. He might have to rebuke me for my life. But I'm going to receive it because I'm a son of God. I am a child of God. And I'm glad about it. Say yes. Say yes. I don't know about you. I'm not illegitimate. But I am his son. I'm not rebellious. Because you see, when you got a child, they won't listen to the rebuke. They won't accept the chastisement. They will pack their bags and run away. All you got to do is know that they are rebellious. But you got a child that will take their whipping and say, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I understand. I receive it. That's the child that's going to keep on climbing. And you got to be the same way. If you are a son, keep on taking what God gives. He's making you better. He's causing you to walk uprightly. He's causing you to be victorious. You're the head, not the tail. You're blessed going in and blessed coming out because I'm a son and there are promises to God to sons. I don't know about you, but I'm standing on the promises of Christ my King through eternal ages. Let his praises ring. Glory in the highest. I shall and sing. I'm standing. I'm standing. Because I'm a son. Come hell or high water. I'm a son. No matter what comes my way. I'm a son. I can take it. If Jesus took it. He'll walk with me. He'll talk with me. He'll tell me that I am his own. Say yes. Say yes.